Hello out there and welcome to episode four of the webinar series Tinkercad Teachers brought to you by Autodesk, a software company that allows you to make anything. The topic of today's web webinar is building a maker mindset at your school. And we're here today in Cambridge, Massachusetts and also in on the West Coast in both Seattle and <laughs> in Los Altos, California and San Francisco. Uh, and we're here to challenge some misconceptions that you may have about what a maker mindset means or even what a maker space is. We believe that any classroom can be a maker space uh, regardless of what resources you have. Because oftentimes we think, when we think maker spaces, we think cool 3D printers and uh, laser cutters and all types of high tech equipment. But today we're here to focus on the mental tools that give maker spaces meaning. So that's primarily what we're gonna be focused on. And I'm very excited about the two guests that we have here today who are experts in that arena of maker mindset. So let's get started. All right, so how to participate today. If you have any questions, you, sh you should see on the right side of your, your screen a chat panel. And in that panel, it allows you to both chat and also ask questions. So we're very interested to hear any thoughts that you have along the way uh, in learning from our two guests today. Uh, or also if you have any questions. Team Tinkercad is out in San Francisco. I usually say sunny San Francisco, but I think it's stormy there <laughs> today. Um, so they're here to answer your questions. Um, and also know that at the end of this episode, the last like 10 or 15 minutes, we'll be doing a question and answer session uh, so that some maybe some of the juicier questions that aren't so easy to answer in a chat window uh, will be asked to our panel today. Uh, so please stick around for that. Also, if you fall behind, don't stress out. Don't worry about it. This is being recorded. This will actually be uploaded to YouTube in about a week. Uh, in about a week, you'll also be receiving an email. And in that email, it'll have the YouTube link. Uh, it will also have this slideshow and other resources that you might need in order to extend your learning uh, from the webinar today. Uh, in addition, I just wanted to note that the last three episodes of Tinkercad Teachers is in a YouTube playlist. Uh, on the Tinkercad uh, YouTube channel in the link right there, that Autodesk link, Tinkercad Teachers will take you to the, the previous episodes. So if you're on the East Coast, we are about to, uh, we have an impending snowstorm. So I was thinking it would be a great uh, school day, uh, snow day uh, binge watch tomorrow. So, uh, so who are we? Uh, my name is Kellyanne Mahoney and I'm a youth program specialist at Autodesk. I'm also a national board certified teacher I spent 13 years teaching in the Boston Public Schools before I joined Autodesk in July, and I also do hold a very fancy master's degree in education. So I'm going to have our guests introduce themselves, and our first guest today is Alec Resnick. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alec, and uh, I'm the director of a new school in Somerville called Powder House Studios. For the past 10 years or so, I've also been running a nonprofit called Sprout that's focused on designing in and after school programs for youth, mostly middle and high school youth people, and evening programs for adults. Cool, thank you, Alec. And next is Wendy Hersey. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm the founding superintendent at Bullish Charter School in Los Altos. Um, and prior to that, I started my teaching career in Canada and then was recruited down to Southern California where I was a teacher and then, then an administrator um, in the entry, middle, and high school levels. That's all I was going to say. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. All right, so, okay. you might be, so you might be here today just because you're interested in our illustrious guests, or you might be here because you're interested in the topic of maker mindset, but maybe you're not familiar with Tinkercad which is the inspiration for this webinar series. So I just wanted to give you a look at what Tinkercad is. It's a free web-based, easy to use, kind of entry level 3D design tool. Um, and what, in a moment you'll be able to actually see, so this is the user interface, so this is what we call the work plane. You can see that when you're designing in Tinkercad, you're just building on basic shapes and making them more complex by combining them and grouping them and maybe subtracting from them as well. Uh, and this new feature that I'm actually showing you right now is uh, it's called the parts maker feature. So if this, this Tinkercad user, maybe she uses this gear all the time in her designs and she doesn't want to have to recreate it over and over again, 
this new parts maker feature actually allows her to save it as a part. So she always has it with her so that she can use it in later designs. It also allows you to save it as like a consistent color and a cons consistent size. And I'm going to be doing a demonstration later that will show you another cool application of using this new feature. What else are we going to learn today? Lots of things. We're going to be talking about how you can cultivate a maker mindset in your students and how to recognize a classroom that has embraced a maker mindset. So our audience today is always teachers, but we also encourage school leaders and even district leaders to check out what we're talking about uh, because we know that a lot of school leaders have been asked to implement new, you know, future ready policies and, and plans and, um, you know, maybe to infuse uh, making into the curriculum. And you might not even know what that looks like. So we're here today to help you understand that and understand what, what, to, what you see when a teacher has actually cultivated a classroom that is built on a maker mindset. So that's one thing that we're going to be learning. Another thing that we're going to be thinking about is how you can drive change at the classroom and school level through design thinking. Design thinking is a really essential element to the maker mindset. And when we think about building the maker mindset at your school, we're obviously building it in students, but we'd also be thinking about how you can build a maker mindset in teachers and school leaders in order to improve your school and make it a better place of learning for everyone. So everyone is a learner at your school, not just the students. What else are we gonna learn? We're gonna learn how to create structures that encourage students and educators alike to build on their abilities no matter what level they're at and integrate their passions with their learning. So passion is a key element to the maker mindset. So we'll be talking about that today too. So our agenda and three quick steps. First off, we're gonna think about why. So the theory behind why you would want to build a maker mindset at your school. And Alec from Powderhouse, who's actually in the process of doing that right now and starting up his own school that's infused with a maker mindset, will be presenting that segment. Part two, you're already convinced because Alec has sold you on why you should build a make maker mindset at your school. So Wendy is going to jump in and she's going to actually talk to you about how to build a maker mindset at your school. Wendy is, has also built a school from the ground up as what Alec is doing right now. And she has years of experience in not just building it, but also implementing it. So she's going to be sharing with you some projects that she's done with students that would illustrate a maker mindset. So helping you see uh, what, what, it, what it would look like if you had a maker mindset at your school. Part three, the tables are turned to you. So this is meant to be a more interactive part of the agenda uh, where I'm gonna do a Tinkercad demo. You can follow along if you want to, or you could just watch, but this is also the part during the episode where you can ask questions to us. So do please stick around for that because we like to have we don't like to just sit here and talk. Like when you're teacher, a teacher in your classroom, you don't want everything to be coming from you. You want to uh, communicate with the people who are participating as well. So we love that. All right, so let's build a maker mindset. Without further ado, this is Alec from Powderhouse, and he's gonna be talking about why a maker mindset. Hi everyone. Um, so like I mentioned before, we've spent uh, the past decade or so running a lot of in and after school programs with youth and evening programs with adults. and because those programs haven't had a lot of the constraints or structure of a school, we've had a chance to see a lot of what's powerful about some of the work that you can do in more creative contexts that people nowadays talk about as a maker mindset or a maker space um, than what you normally find in a, in a classroom that might be constrained to your typical 40 minutes or a standards-based lesson. And two of the biggest themes that we've run across that I think really matter and have really mattered to us as we've thought about the process of starting at Powderhouse are that a lot of the times, two of the biggest things teachers end up thinking about are motivating people and making sure people understand. And in our experience, that ends up requiring a level of individualization and a level of actually using the things that you're learning that can be really hard to, to put into a traditional lesson, especially when you start talking about uh, some of the technical fields that you often find adjacent to making. And so for us at Powderhouse, a lot of the inspiration that we drawn from and thinking about how to structure an actual school that supports people in working on projects of their own design has ended up coming from lots of different types of workplaces and other creative contexts. So if you look at a, a place like an ad agency or an artist studio um, or a kindergarten classroom and you think about what the really essential characteristics of work and the environment are there, you run into a lot of things that are often hard to incorporate into a traditional classroom setting. Things like large blocks of contiguous time, things like 
intrinsically interdisciplinary projects, potentially mixed age teams, people making things that have a real audience. And a lot of that's very hard to do if you're asking you know, 25 to 35 people all to learn the same thing on the same day. And so for us, the, the real strength of a maker mindset um, end up coming out in the fact that when you're making something, you can make something of your own design, right? So in a traditional product-based environment, even though a lot of times people are working on projects, one of the distinguishing factors for us between a, a traditional project-based environment and a maker mindset ends up being the fact that people are making something of their own design when they're making something, whereas oftentimes just because of the realities of the classroom, in a project-based environment, you end up designing the project for someone and they may do the project and you may you know, draw a box around the, the piece that they have control over, but the logistics of getting it done on time or getting it exhibited or making sure that it works or making sure that it covers a certain set of standards means that uh, you end up having to take out a lot of the uncertainty. And that comes to the, the second piece of people both understanding what they're working with, but also being motivated to do it. And so at Powderhouse, we're aiming to build an environment where people are working on projects which meet a few very basic uh, goals. One of them is that they're hard for them. And obviously things can be gratuitously hard in ways that aren't educational. But one of the challenges I think in a traditional classroom is that everyone's, if everyone's learning the same thing on the same day, inevitably you have some people who are ahead or some people who are behind. And one of the nice things about projects, especially projects that people design for themselves, is that it's a little bit more like going to the gym. It's a little bit more like a lot of different people working at their own level at their own pace. And for that to actually work, it means that people have to be engaged in and care about the things they're working on. Otherwise, people with the classroom management is basically impossible. And so that means that a lot of times what you need to do is you have to redesign a lot of the work in such a way that you can make sure that the projects that people tackle are going to matter to them. And even with those two things in hand, you still have to think about what, what are people actually learning, right? And so if you're not designing forward from a set of standards in some of these experiences, you're going to have to think about what are some of the powerful ideas that you think, even if two people to do very different projects, people will inevitably uh, end up touching on or, or working through. And that's often a choice about what domain your program is situated in, what tools people are using. Uh, and then for us, the, the fourth and kind of most important bullet point at the secondary level for us is that we're very interested in building people's ability to work independently. And a lot of the metacognitive and self-efficacy skills that we're interested in we think come out really clearly in projects that people design and tackle for themselves. Um, and one of the clearest ways to think about that is just the time scale that people are able to, to manage themselves and their resources and their time on. And so when we come back to thinking through the value of a maker mindset, the pieces that we're most frequently thinking about are the fact that uh, context where people are making things that matter to them of their own design switches out a lot of the classroom management challenges you see in a traditional setting for a different set of challenges, but for a set of challenges that aren't about necessarily motivating people. Um, and we think often ends up putting you in a situation where you can address a lot of the fragility of people's understanding when people are just learning something for a test or just trying to match patterns just long enough to get them through the next assignment because the type of organic use and uncertainty of the ideas that are at the base of a, of a project when you're actually tackling a project, ends up meaning that it's much, much, much harder for somebody to get through a project not understanding something that's required to complete the project than it is for them to get through you know, a worksheet or a typical assignment. Thank you all. That's such an important point. And that's a question that I even had in, in starting to research and develop this episode is, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of PBL. It's the, you know, making, but in thinking about what is the relationship between making and project-based learning is a really interesting question to delve deeply into. So next we have Wenny, and she is going to talk about how to build a maker mindset and how she's actually done that at Bullis Charter School. Thank you. Well, I wanted to start off a little bit um, in regards to, you know, what is making? Because a lot of times when I talk to people, they're a little bit stymied. They think that making has to occur in, a, like you said, Kellyanne, in a specific, um, you know, space with specific materials. And so I love this quote because whether you're doing something it's because it's your passion or you have to do it for a part of your job or whether it's just for fun or you're actually trying to solve real world problems, or all of the above, um, everyone is a maker and everybody has the capability of uh, being a maker. And in fact, we really feel that children are natural makers. So we're um, educating students um, in kindergartens right up to eighth grade. And so we really feel like, um, how do we uh, take what 
they naturally have that's innate and how do we nurture it but of course as a, um, a public school we have to also <laughs> like Alex said um, uh, teach the standards we have very specific standards and uh, how do you where's this um, integration or where is the you know intersection of uh, true making but ensuring that your students are um, becoming proficient learners not e not only um, in um, the areas that um, you want them to you know really get like Alex was Alec was talking about in these success skills in those um, types of things that are going to be the life skills uh, whether they're engaged and they're truly working to their passions so Kellyanne if you could go to the next slide um, what Bolas what we do is that we use making to spark our students imagination and empower them them as learners um, to become proficient in those standards that we are accountable for. So um, uh, whether they are, like I said, these Common Core State Standards or the um, NGSS, um, and if you go to the next slides, um, even the things that we don't have specific standards on and we just have frameworks, um, we really feel that uh, making allows us to integrate all these areas, all these disciplines, and it, we bring together our team. So it's um, really in terms of design thinking process, this radical collaboration, where we actually start with the standards and we have a multidisciplinary team of educators who come together and they look to see, well, what are the um, things that students must um, be proficient at by the end of the grade level or beyond? And obviously, you know, we start just with the, the, um, stand, the grade level standards, but, um, then uh, we really rely and give a lot of freedom um, to these experts to integrate um, their knowledge and their um, really experience and expertise and in fact also their passions. So you cannot have students be the type having the maker mindset if you do not have staff members who also embody those types of skills and those type that mindset as well. So we put our staff in the situation where they too must engage in the design thinking process, create these units, think about ways that students um, can um, demonstrate um, proficiency uh, and growth and whether it's in art or drama or music or whether it's in like I said those uh, success skills um, we really feel that uh, we have to create these opportunities and yet allow students then also to be able to learn no matter what their uh, ability level no matter what their passions and then as well as make these opportunities for learning really authentic and personalized so I'm going to give you a couple of um, examples in two um, grade levels, first grade and se uh, seventh grade, and uh, hopefully you will see all those things that Alec talked about and all of the other things that I've just brought up. So in first grade, one of our um, favorite units is a, an entrepreneurial unit called Kid Town. And these students are tasked to determine what makes a business successful. And you can see that it touches on all these academic standards as well as the um, you know success skills or the life skills. So next slide. Um, students are given um, a um, amount of startup money and obviously it's not real money and they are um, told to go and determine um, what types of businesses would um, their peers uh, uh, enjoy and they will then uh, purchase with their startup money the raw materials and you see them in the top picture and these raw materials are anything that anybody can gather whether they're egg cartons or uh, you know uh, cardboard um, pieces from leftover cardboard boxes to you know straws anything that you may have and these students go and purchase them and then they are going to create this business they're going to actually produce um, their wares and they are going to open shop per se. So at the bottom you see, sorry, if you go back to the last slide, at the bottom you will see that these students are actually now open for business. And what's really cool about this is not just the integration of the math skills, um, they're giving change, you know, they're obviously uh, learning how to budget, they're all going to keep track on um, their income, but 
uh, we actually have uh, Mandarin starting in kindergarten. And so we uh, have parents who come in or community members who come in and these students have to give change and uh, use uh, their knowledge in uh, numbers uh, in Mandarin and engage with those customers in that way. Next slide. So um, engineering, uh, you if you know the engineering standards for kindergarten to second grade, you obviously know that not only are they constructing things, they are actually creating products and they have to go back to their customers and get feedback in terms of, well, you know, are, is this something you're going to purchase or does this actually reflect what I'm trying to build? And there's some physical examples there. And as again, you know, popsicle sticks, I mean, any raw material so anybody can make. What I love about the picture in the top right hand is that um, it uh, integrates uh, other grade level. And so these older kids uh, are from fourth grade. And so they are actually taking data on, um, you know, how these uh, shops are doing. And so they go back and they're going to graph and they're going to analyze. And so they can also um, really learn from what the first graders are doing. In terms of, next slide, um, social studies and English language arts, our students actually take a field trip downtown and they visit local businesses and they learn about them. Um, they not only learn about how um, these businesses are run and what it entails, but also things like rent and where, why certain areas of town um, may be more expensive uh, in terms of rent because of its location. Also in social studies, they're learning about the neighborhoods and they're learning about directionality so all that is folded in there and so when they actually get back to their classrooms and have to set up shop they actually have to pay rent depending on where the location of their little table is their shop is because is it somewhere where there's gonna be more traffic and so they they learn um, things like that in terms of the economy um, and at the very end they have to actually pitch their business um, if you go back uh, to the um, uh, in investors and explain to them whether their business was uh, a successful one. And if so or not, they actually have to write an opinion piece to our mayor um, and to uh, try to convince him or her the type of business that should also be included in our town. Next. Um, here's another great example of um, uh, how you can uh, utilize art, technology, music, uh, no matter um, what the, the level um, is in terms of ability for our students as well as maybe interest. So you can create art using um, the technology like you see in the uh, lower left or you can simply like the big um, you know poster board um, in the middle uh, it's just is just paper and pencils and crayons right um, and then um, our students are tasked to create these big uh, posters as well as these little ads and um, they learn an art uh, um, you know say anything from primary colors or what makes something pop out you know um, as well as in math if they've got a sheet of paper how do you arrange all the letters so that they fit into this piece of paper and that's math as well so you can see the little um, ad on the right hand side for lemon cup they decide to put a lot of space in between the word lemon and cup to make sure it sort of fit <laughs> so that was you know um, artistically you know the way they decided to design so any child can participate and be a maker in this way in music, I wanted to show you um, some jingles. And again, um, whether this is uh, students who are really um, proficient in beats and rhymes. Um, so in again, integrating other things than music. It's obviously there's math in there and there's like English language arts. Um, you can see how these can be personalized. So I'm gonna have all three of them played starting from the top right hand corner. And I hope you enjoy this. The first one is that lemon pop. Um, one that you saw for the poster for. All right. <laughs> and then do you want you to play the next one? Oh, wait, this is the. It's no. this one, Winnie, right? Yes. Come to our electronic store. We sell boats and helicopter boards. Buy a rock kit and start playing. And you have both, you'll be happy, we guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> I love the ending of that one. Do you want me to play the third one? Yes, please. Welcome to our Gold Bear Store. We 
小喵子，小公哥哥。All right, so there's a lot of guaranteeing of happiness there, but you can see it started off with very simple couplet to more sophisticated with some action, and then the last one there was even beatboxing. So, um, you know, obviously these kids are very passionate about what they're selling. Going to the next grade level, um, we have um, in seventh grade something called Engineering Design Challenge. And I want to share this one with you because oftentimes you want to have something where you're not creating something new every single year. However, you still want to, like Alex say, said, make something extremely authentic, meaningful, engaging, right, for the students. So there's lots of opportunities for them to take um, the project in any direction they want. They're not feeling like they're stymied in a box and being, you know, really, it's just sort of this false um, choice type of thing going on. So um, what you'll also see is that these students are engaging in the design thinking process. Um, and so, um, uh, they're, they're a little bit more sophisticated in their ability. So in seventh grade, what we try to do is we ask them to go out and, and figure out what is a challenge in our community. So they go and they interview uh, staff members, community members, other students. So uh, one of the teams this year, if we can go um, to the next slide, please. Um, uh, talk to one of our teachers who uh, teaches a gardening class and um, also bird watching. And uh, she was uh, concerned because her students couldn't watch the birds uh, in the bird feeders that she had set up because these pesky squirrels uh, were causing the seeds to, to um, spill onto the ground and it's really hard to see the birds and anyways there aren't very many that come because the squirrels eat most of them so that's the empathy um, step and then they define what it is that they need to uh, create and what they're trying to solve and they decided they're going to uh, uh, create something called a squirrel proof bird feeder and they, they entitled it bird style so if you can go to the next slide this is actually one slide for many, many steps. Our students ideate um, what it is that they feel they um, could create. They go through pro the prototyping and testing many times over and over. So you can, um, I just took some of the um, words from their presentation, but they started off with different shapes and they decided on a cone and then they tweaked the cone so that the angle was more slippery. And then they decided to put it on the ground instead of in a tree. And then if you go to the next slide, um, after even videotaping, um, you know, each one of the prototypes to see, you know, whether um, it was effective or not, they decided that they are going to put a clear dome on the very top of it. And so I wanted to show you that they use paper and pencil, <laughs> as well as, if you go to the next slide, um, Tinkercad. And so this is their final product. Um, and you can see that they are uh, sharing it uh, to um, uh, this one happens to be our uh, assistant principal, but their uh, parents came in, community members came in. So they had the opportunity to to show what they had created. Um, and um, another project that uh, along the same lines that uh, our students engaged in using the design thinking process was um, this group talked to a first grade class and really found that the sink was inaccessible to these little first graders. Not only could they not reach the handle or the water, they couldn't reach the towel um, dispenser or the soap very well. And so they decided that they were going to, um, in the next slide, uh, create something called the Zeus Sink. And the reason why actually um, the Zeus Sink was they wanted to um, really work on the entire sink. And they actually started with the towel dispenser. And they, um, the prototype was a, in a, like a monster with a mouth and that spit out the uh, paper towels. And they found out that when they went to test it with the first graders, the first graders didn't want to go near it. They thought it was really scary. So then they changed it to become uh, the Zeus theme because everybody loves Dr. Seuss. And so you will see that the uh, what they ended up doing is that when they were 
focusing on actually um, having the students be able to reach the water or the water reach them, you can see that they used Tinkercad and they decided on this elephant shape. So you can see on the next slide that, um, um, oh, actually this slide, I apologize, is what they uh, first started uh, creating with a for the um, handles of the sink so this is a, a piece that was supposed to uh, attach the handle so that the students could reach it faster but they actually ran out of time which is another really great thing that students um, get to try out they realize that you know they aren't um, able to um, really take on everything that they had intended because they wanted to do the entire sink. And then they also, with this one here, um, the shape of the elephant, it didn't quite fit well. It was too small. They couldn't get it to fit over the actual spout. And so they went through many iterations. Um, and at the end, they decided to focus just on the faucet piece. And so you'll see in the next slide that they went quite in depth. And uh, really, Tinkercad was an awesome tool for them. It was so user-friendly, it allowed them to see everything from so many different dimensions. So you'll see the final product. Um, and they actually printed this up with the 3D printer. Um, and there it is. And if you go to the last one, you'll see that now the water actually reaches the students. And the yeah. bottom picture that I wanted to show you was the, you know, them using actually just very basic raw materials uh, as they were working on that towel dispenser. So I just wanted to give some examples um, here um, really to reinforce that everyone can make. It doesn't matter what materials you have. It doesn't matter what grade level, but to instill this um, mindset is to really allow students the opportunity to take some risks, to really um, take their passions into areas that, you know, that they want to really engage in and to give them opportunities to solve some real world uh, problems. Thank, Thank you, Annie. I want to sink. Is it for sale? <laughs> yeah, I told them they need to go to Shark Tank because I think a lot of people really like that. Yeah, I'm four foot eleven. It's tough. <laughs> All right. So, in I know that a lot of you out here are might be used, thinking about using this webinar as part of your evaluation, which is great. Um, we hope that you're having fun, but we're also hoping that you're, you're finding this useful for your professional development. Uh, so, we always try to give you a few ideas uh, to to extend your learning. So that you can create artifacts that you know. I know when I was um, when I was a classroom teacher, oftentimes I would need to, as part of my evaluation, present artifacts of my learning or artifacts of my teaching uh, to my evalu evaluator. So I was just thinking that it would be helpful for you to have some project ideas. So one project idea, uh, which is very relevant to what we're going to be doing next, is maybe to think about how you could make your classroom a maker project. Um, so. In thinking about the maker mindset and thinking about, you know, any classroom could be a maker space with some imagination um, and whatever resources that you have, you might think about how you could uh, re-envision your classroom and visualize it using Tinkercad or, or Fusion 360, which is also something I'm going to show you in a bit as well. Um, or you might even, one time when I taught, actually a few times when I was teaching middle school, I actually engaged my students in just rearranging my whole classroom. You, you know, I had new furniture one time and I let them lay out the room. And for me, it was kind of like, you know, oftentimes as a teacher, it's like you try to, you know, you try to like make, you know, it's our classroom and it's our community, but you know, it's like giving away a little of that power and that autonomy is, is difficult at times. Um, and it, I think that it's also a good first step to getting into the maker mindset is to make even your physical space in your classroom more student centered. You might even research the concept of flexible learning spaces and write about how the design of a school's physical environment might help foster making a um, foster a maker mindset. And that will this one will be more clearly illustrated in the demonstration I'm going to be doing. Another idea that we thought about um, in thinking about uh, Alex's presentation was thinking about how maybe you could write a maker educator memoir. So in, I know, for example, one of my friends who I think is out there probably listening in BPS is an excellent chef. I've actually been, have benefited from her, her talents in thinking about, is your kitchen, is that your personal maker space? Is it your garden? Um, what objects in these spaces fire your imagination and awaken your passions? What helps you improve? What might make making in your own life? How can that connect to your theories about learning? So this could be an opportunity to write about yourself as a maker and then how that connects to maybe your, your theories on learning. Um, so in expanding and refining your definition of what making means, 
How has making change or influenced you personally or intellectually? And what implications might this have for your teaching practice and for your students? So we thought both of these projects could be two good first steps to getting yourself into a maker mindset and to be able to show others what that means. Also, we're very excited next week when you get your email with the link to this recording and the slideshow, we also made you this fancy certificate because we want to celebrate your learning. So um, this will be coming next week. Uh, it does say beneath it that uh, this certificate is for two hours of professional development. So what that means is that you've participated in this webinar that usually runs about an hour or so, and then you've extended your learning in some way in, for an hour. So again, we also will be sharing with you some additional resources to help you with the two suggested pro projects that we came up with for this episode. All right, so at this point, we're going to turn the tables to you. So I'm going to be doing a Tinkercad demonstration. Uh, you can, you may right now go to tinkercad.com and try to follow along. If you uh, go to, uh, so this link that's in the slideshow is, uh, is a link to a, a learning space that, that I created in Tinkercad. But in the gallery, if you just search Tinker Learning Space, it's public, it should come up. But once you get the slideshow, you'll have a link to it as well, the file that I'm going to be showing today. All right, so this is actually a creation that I made using the new parts, the reusable parts or the parts maker feature. Uh, so this is a learning space that I, I thought of. And I was thinking this would be like my dream classroom. Uh, so you can see that I have, there's art, there's uh, there's a 3D printer, there's a recycling bin. <laughs> um, there's also, there's a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, so these are all actually parts that I found in the Tinkercad gallery. So I'm gonna show you how I did this. But one day uh, when I was working on this, I actually left my computer out on my dining room table and walked away and my nine-year-old daughter sat in front of it. And when I came back, I looked at my screen and she had actually put together a class from herself. Um, but it was all in neat rows, which was interesting to me. But she said it was a really fun project. So this might be a project that you could do with your students, either finding furniture in the Tinkercad gallery or in creating furniture yourself. Or you might try to base the furniture on uh, the furniture you actually have or the things that you actually have in your classroom uh, if you want to provide those constraints or it could be the dream classroom. So, but this is just one idea. And I'm also gonna show you how I went from Tinkercad and then imported it into a program, another free tool made by Autodesk that's Fusion 360 in order to create a more realistic rendering of a classroom environment. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So first off, how I began, and how I begin a lot of my designs is in the Tinkercad gallery. So I've gone to the gallery, I thought about my learning space, and I felt like my learning space was missing music. So I searched for a guitar in the Tinkercad gallery. And this is going to show you how I can turn this design into a part. So I'm searching. I find a guitar that I like. Do know that later on when I send you the resources uh, in the email, I'm going to share with you the links to everyone's creations that made my, my learning space. Because in the Tinkercad community, we really care about crediting the sources of the different creations that we found and tinkered with. So I'm selecting this guitar. And you'll see me doing that by drawing a big box around it. I'm going away from the basic shapes and I'm going to go into part collection and then I'm going to click capture new part. So I'm going to name it guitar. I could actually uh, lock it so that it stays the same size, but I don't want to do that because I don't know what the scale is going to be once I put it into my classroom. So from there, I'm going back just to home to Tinkercad. I'm going to create a new design. And then I am going to go to my part collection. My part collection is starting to look a little bit like Ikea. Um, but for me, that's a good thing because um, I enjoy Ikea a lot. So I've collected a whole bunch of furniture and a whole bunch of different objects uh, from the gallery. And I want to start putting them into my learning space. So I'm going to drag out my guitar first. And this is also a good exercise for students who are just maybe new to Tinkercad and just need to learn the basic moves. So rotating, you can also teach them about angles that way as well. Lifting, so that's how you lift something off of the work plane. And then I also realized that this guitar is too big. So I'm scaling it down. I'm scaling it down by hitting the shift key because that will maintain the proportions while making it smaller. 
So I'm looking around and seeing what else I want to put in my, my classroom. So I put in my table. Do you know that if you have like a learning space with a floor, you've got to kind of lift it up out of the floor so you can see the bottom of it. And I'm adjusting things around. And again, all of these parts that I have in my part collection are just either things I've made or things that I've found in the Tinkercad gallery. And I'll give you a list of some of these things that you see in the classroom too. Let's do one more. I might do uh, some chairs. So when I'm just dragging out the chairs, you can't do a duplicate when you're using parts. And then I'm grabbing a table. So you guys get the gist of how you would do this and how this would be something that would be easy for students to do. Again, my nine-year-old was able to do this without my permission, but it was okay. <laughs> I think then I go elaborate and get a plant, but. Um, all right, so next. So the next step is you have your classroom all together. You have it looking the way that you want it to look or your learning space or your maker space. My guitar's there now, which is very exciting. So then how do I get it out of, uh, out of Tinkercad and put it into Fusion 360, which is the next step. So what you just saw me doing there is I hit export, export. That's the same process that you would use if you wanted to 3D print this. Uh, if you were 3D printing it, you would want to make an, typically you would use an STL file, but I chose an OBJ file. And the reason why I made it an OBJ file is OBJ files uh, maintain more information than the STLs in regard to color, for example, because with STL, it doesn't really matter if you're 3D printing something, it doesn't matter what color it is that you make things in Tinkercad. Uh, it depends on what color filament you have in your 3D print printer. But for the OBJ files, it maintains the color so that when I import it into Fusion 360, which I'm gonna show you in a second, the objects, so all like the chairs that are orange are all grouped together. Uh, so that when I start to color things in Fusion 360, uh, it's, it, they're all going to be grouped together. So that makes it a little bit easier. All right, so next. So next is a big step. And this is Fusion 360. This is what it looks like. Fusion 360 is a tool that uh, is, when you think about 3D designing in Tinkercad, so see I'm, I'm uploading right now. So this is how you upload. I'm choosing that object. And I'm not going to actually, I've already uploaded it. I didn't want you to have to sit around and watch me upload it, <laughs> but that's how you do it. So Fusion 360 is not just a tool for rendering, but that's primarily what I'm going to use it for. Right now, you'll see that it's in the sculpt environment. And if I really wanted to mess around with the shape a little bit more, like maybe like add some more organic curves to some of the objects that I have in the room, or um, if I wanted to like add to it in ways that maybe I couldn't do in Tinkercad, I could do that here. It's, it's a tool that's more of a professional tool, but it is also free for educators and students. What you see me doing here now is I am selecting everything and then I'm gonna use free move and I'm choosing the, the axis that I wanna rotate on just so I can flip it over so that, it, and I won't always want it to be 90 degrees. So people use Fusion 360 for like industrial design. You can like design lamps. You can, um, you can also simulate. Um, so it, it's a really powerful tool. And it's really cool in, in thinking about, so we've gone through this journey with Wenny with, uh, with elementary school. And we also heard from Alec. Uh, so this might be one kind of step up um, for maybe with high school students, the project that you might want to start out in, uh, in teaching design to students. Rendering is a good first step. It's kind of like coloring. A lot of times in the Tinkercad community, people ask about adding textures uh, to their objects, and this is a good way to do it. So I'm going to go to Modify and then Appearance. And when I click on Appearance, you'll see that I this window pops up, and there's all these different materials and textures. So there's plastic. There's even some organic materials like water. Um, there are there's foam, there's metal. So you can see them all here. I actually have too many of them open. Uh, so you see, I want to uh, color the beanbag chairs and they're all grouped together because they are all the same color in my Tinkercad design. I wasn't able to, to put that matte leather on the beanbags because I hadn't downloaded it yet. So the ones that you see with the arrows, like the download arrows next to them, I need to download them. It only takes like a second. Um, but that's why that didn't work. But you can see now up in the top, 
there's actually all of the materials and colors that I've used start collecting up in that top panel, so it makes it easier. But basically, it's like coloring what I did. So next, I'm looking to color the, the tabletops. And again, because they're all grouped together in that OBJ file, they all kind of color at once. So I made that pine. I made the floor a nice bamboo floor. And then I also just in aesthetically was thinking that I wanted this to not look super realistic. I wanted it to almost look kind of like a stop motion learning space. So I took the walls and I made them paper rather than something that would be more of a construction sort of material. And I left kind of little slits because you'll see these the lines that are kind of uh, cutting through the space. These lines will actually determine like shadows and light when we get into the rendering environment, which is cool. So I'll show a little bit more of this just so you can get a sense of coloring. It's fun to color. It's fun to watch people color too, I think. So there's my walls are now a paper white. And I'm moving it around. You use that cube is similar to the cube that's in Tinkercad. Um, you can use that cube to, um, to orbit around. There's also the hand at the bottom of the screen that you can pan with too. I do that later. So next I think I'm gonna do the chairs and I'm gonna make them a shiny red plastic. I believe that's what I do. And after the chairs, we're gonna go into the rendering and I'll show you what that looks like. And there's all different finishes to choose from as well. So I picked shiny red because there was no orange. And then you see all the chairs actually turn that red color. All right, so the next step, so after, so you can see it's starting to look more realistic. So the next step is I have everything colored and now I wanna render. So when you're rendering something, you're taking, so you, you've, ha you've made all the geometry of the shapes that you want, but now you wanna try to make it look more realistic by adding light and adding shadows. So see how all those lines that were there before kind of turned into shadows and reflections. So I went from the sculpting environment to the rendering environment. And from here, you can kind of move around. You can see now I'm using the, the hands to pan. I'm using the, um, the cube up at the top to shift the angle because I'm trying to get a nice shot. Like it's like I'm almost lining this up to take a nice picture. So when I'm happy with the way that it looks, I'll go up to that. There's a teapot in the upper right and I click on that. And then that starts taking pictures of what I've made. So I'm gonna click render. And then down below in the rendering gallery, you'll see the first one. So then I might change the angle again and take a different shot. I might like take like a close up shot. Um, and this is actually interesting as an English teacher was actually my background. Um, media literacy was actually, uh, became part of the common core standards. So I always did, I taught students about shots and angles and the significance of them and how that changes meaning. So this could even be a good English project to think about uh, angles and shots and you know why you would use a close up shot versus like a, a you know bird's eye view or a, you know a, in lighting effects as well. All right, so you'll see that I, I take about three pictures. So there I'm zooming in and then I render and take a picture. In the next step, you'll actually see the three pictures down below. So I'm gonna to skip to that. All right, so here um, is, so I just wanted to show you that you can, so you can see down below, I have one of my pictures is already processing. It takes about like 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes for the picture to process. It's kind of like old school, like Polaroid pictures. You're like waiting for it to develop. Uh, so this is rendering in Canvas. Um, so this is just kind of fun to watch the way that it kind of dematerializes and then materializes. It kind of reminds me of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, that scene where everybody dematerializes. Um, so this is super cool and you can see how students would find this really fun. So next step. So 
ultimately when the pictures develop, they look like something like this. Um, so I just wanted to show you, um, I know that students would be, this is something that they would probably find really fun to do, especially if they're into gaming too, like designing environments for video games is a really cool skill too. And it's just a good first step. It's a nice pathway from Tinkercad to Fusion 360. Uh, this link here uh, is just a link to, if you if you copy it down, it's Autodesk slash EdTools. This takes you to the page that shows you how you download everything, um, all of the tools uh, that we have available for educators that are free for educators, students, and startups that make less than $160,000 a year, which I think I wonder what startups make more than that. <laughs> also, just keep in mind that for Fusion 360, you need to be at least 13 to sign up. Some other resources I wanted to just make you aware of is Making Starts Here. So this is a website uh, that was created by Autodesk as a place to capture uh, how you can download free software for teachers, um, different project ideas, instructable. So it's just a wealth of resources that I just wish every educator knew about. So that's makingstartshere.com. A cool resource, like a super amazing resource on Making Starts Here is the Maker Program Starter Kit. So this is an, actually a book. So if you go to Making Starts Here and go to the Maker Program Starter Kit, you can actually either download this book as a PDF or you can glance through it just like this. This is just directly from the website. And this is just basically like a playbook for if you want to start a maker space or uh, in your community or in your school. Uh, it, it gives you step-by-step -step roadmap to, to how you would go about doing it. Even towards the, the book is about like 160 pages long, I think. Towards the end of the book, there's an appendix that has all types of worksheets. Um, there's lists of, you know, leveled lists based on the, what resources you have available in terms of like what products you might want to have in your makerspace. Uh, there's also um, mark, there's even worksheets for how you can market your makerspace. So it's just like it's a wealth of resources that I think everybody should know about. All right, so at this point in the episode is when we are going to be doing question and answers. But before we do that, I just wanted to, uh, to encourage you, uh, everyone out there, for us to all stay connected. I feel like that's a really essential element to the maker mindset is authentic connections with uh, other communities of makers. Um, so in, in regard to Tinkercad, we have a Tinkercad forum, a Tinkercad help center. So these links are all available to you when you get the slideshow. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Pinterest. So these are just different ways for us to stay connected and, and I encourage everyone to do so. So Kayla out in not sunny San Francisco, but stormy San Francisco is what I've gathered. Um, are, do we have any questions for the panel? Yes, we do. Um, there was a question that came through earlier about how do you frame uh, projects and I'm um, speaking to totally open ended projects and framing those. Uh, at Powder House, at least the way that we've done that in our programs historically is often by finding a theme that can generate projects. So instead of coming in and saying everyone's going to do project X, X for example, uh, one of the programs we run for quite some time is called Signs of Life. And in it, people are exploring what it means for something to be alive through a variety of projects and project ideas. So some people build things that are alive in one way or another. So basic robots that respond to feedback or software that implements some sort of evolutionary process. But some folks are reading and writing sci-fi around that theme. With older kids, we've done pro-life and pro-choice debates. With younger kids, we can go out on nature walks. But the idea is that the, the program is defined not by the activities that people do, but, the, but by the ideas that might tie together people's projects. And so then staff's responsibility is to help people um, understand what the scope of possible projects might look like, right? So you might do activities that introduce people to the idea of a robot or a discussion or making a piece of art or writing a play, uh, but don't necessarily have everyone walk through making that. And so the goal in the first phase of our program is generally to give people a sense of what are the big ideas in the program and what are the types of projects that they might do. So that by the end of say the first quarter or third of the program, everyone's come to, to choose a type of project, a, a project that they want to pursue. And most of the program ends up being devoted to supporting people in much more individualized ways and actually completing those projects and actually documenting and exhibiting them. And we're expecting something similar to, to be happening at Powder House, although we're excited to take advantage of the fact that instead of just dealing with programs, we'll be working with people for you know, four plus years. And so we'll be able to take on much more ambitious projects, which eventually might not be contextualized by a particular program or program team. Love it how 
Alec is always keeping it real, which is an essential element of the maker mindset, I think. Winnie, did you have any? Yeah, because we're um, really grounded in PBL and the gold standard, uh, we actually have a, a, a driving question. And so we will say things to the students like, how might we, just like the first one was, um, what makes some businesses fail? How might we create a business that will be successful? Um, kindergarten, how might, you know, we will have actually a lead in type of a little um, exercise. So maybe a zookeeper will call up and say, oh, you know, I'm really having trouble figuring out um, a, a really good ethical enclosure. And I have these two animals that are coming from, you know, I know from all the different biomes. And how do you do that? And so that's the lead in. It's really cool. So authentic connections to the community as well is really important to the maker mindset. Absolutely. And some of them are actual things that our students, as they get older, students are, um, are working with actual scientists. So, for example, you know, how do you protect leatherback sea turtles? And so we have students creating things like uh, temperature readers in nests um, and to um, enrichment uh, type uh, products for bears that are, um, you know, in captivity. So cool. So ac also access to professionals who work in maybe some of the careers that students might want to pursue. Absolutely. And so nowadays with technology, it's really easy to have these people engage. You know, you use Skype, you can send the files digital, you know, digi digitally to them and they can get feedback. Um, so it's, it's really exciting for the kids. That's super cool. Any other questions, Kayla? Yes, we did have another question. Do you have any suggestions for creating a space for students with autism who are mostly nonverbal? Um, in the programs that we've run with schools, uh, many of whose kids have autism or some other spectrum disorder diagnosis, um, we've never run programs with entirely nonverbal folks, but one of the biggest shifts ended up being focusing a lot on the sensory experience of being in a maker space or being in a space where lots of people are making things or cutting things or touching different things, where you're also thinking about a situation where unlike kind of like a drop-in maker space or a library environment, you're thinking instead about oftentimes how a paraprofessional or some other guide might be standing alongside or working alongside somebody and you might have a room full of half a dozen to a dozen kind of pairs like that. And you end, we've ended up at least thinking much more in those contexts about how you manage sensory input and stimulation in those environments. And so one of the things that that ended up meaning was that uh, we talked with those paraprofessionals ahead of time about what might be happening um, with the person that they were working with that day and brought everyone to basically a big materials table where along with their paraprofessional, they took the things that they're going to, to use, went off to their own areas um, that we'd already thought through kind of like how we wanted to visually and otherwise isolate some areas or not isolate others. Uh, and so it ended up being kind of a much more customized experience. So I don't know that we have experience doing it, uh, designing a whole space around that, but that's been our experience designing specific experiences around making some of those environments. Yeah, I agree with Alex. Um, so we uh, have students where, uh, that may need um, so a quieter area and so because really we don't have our maker space is just a regular uh, portable um, it's not like we have a, a you know some special room um, it's really making happening in the classroom so like any classroom uh, it we just provide opportunities in quieter spaces uh, maybe carols and it depends on where on the spectrum the student is some um, like Alex saying um, just having a variety of materials is really really um, engaging for them and so just really being cognizant of uh, what types of um, things that they are uh, most likely to uh, gravitate towards if they have any sensory you know defensiveness and so some things don't work um, you just have to just have a lot of different choice for them to use and uh, I think what's great about making is that you don't actually need to talk <laughs> you know um, and so you can express yourself in a different way and then you can present it and show um, your understanding um, in many different ways as well and so we have everything from electric portfolios to like you saw with with the students, you know, literally standing up and giving presentations and pitches. Yeah, and thinking about autism as a primarily it's a communication disorder. So it, I was just thinking what Winnie was thinking is just it's another way, making is another way for autistic students to show what they know, 
and to communicate with others and even to make friends as well because it's like if they make something cool and maybe they're teamed together with someone that maybe you know has has like a deficit in another area and they're able to collaborate together and you know be able to kind of show off together what they know it's also a great way to build social skills too any other questions kayla we have one last question. Um, so it's actually Kellyanne about the um, maker booklet that you shared. Um, and so it says in the book that you mentioned, are this there space furniture and layout suggestions for designing maker spaces? Um, and I guess kind of opening up to the rest of the team, um, you know, if you have any suggestions around that as well. I think you guys just mentioned a couple of great things, but um, any suggestions there? Suggestions, I didn't hear what you said before. Oh, sorry, designing maker spaces. The furniture okay. layout space. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, like the whole book is full of ideas for laying out maker spaces. But I think that's really what makes the book such a great resource is it takes into consideration. There's like three different levels in terms of uh, what resources you might have and how you know you can have a maker space that's mobile, like how you know Wendy was talking about. Um, you can have a maker space that maybe is more high tech with high tech equipment, but also but just designing it around you know, the, the users and around, you know, what the, the learning environment is. Um, so, I mean, I love that how when in Winnie's school, it's the makerspace is mobile. So it's moving from classroom to classroom. And, and there's different varieties of um, examples of how to set up a makerspace in the book. Did that answer the question? <laughs> yes, that did. Um, I think that's all the questions that we had. Thank you. Nice. All right, well, <laughs> we sort of ended on time. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our awesome guests, Wendy Hersey <laughs> and Alec Resnick. Um, so, uh, and also just to thank everybody here that joined us today. Uh, we encourage you to stay connected. Uh, we will have upcoming webinars that you'll be hearing about soon. Uh, please also look out for that email with the link to the recording and all the resources. And also please, free, feel, please feel free to reach out to us at Tinkercad teachers at autodesk.com. If you have any specific questions about this webinar or any of the earlier webinars as well. Um, and we also want to thank Autodesk who have uh, who inspire us to make anything. Um, so thank you so much and we hope that you join us again. <laughs>